As an ecologist in today's world, hope is the one crucial element that keeps us going. Much of what we do takes years and decades to understand. Data, the cornerstone of our work, is often disparate and available in pockets. It is for us to bring together this information and make sense of it all, to help dissipate the fog of the unknown and bring in a new direction in thinking. So I'm an ecologist and my research focuses on trying to understand how climate change influences the biodiversity structure and functioning of natural ecosystems and reciprocally how the biodiversity that's present in these systems can act as a buffer to attenuate some of these uh, impacts of climate change. And most of my work has been carried out in grassland and savanna ecosystems worldwide. But more recently, we've sort of extended our work to also include the forest ecosystems, such as forests, savannas, and grasslands in India, to try and understand how they're absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere, how much CO2 they take down every year, how this is changing over time, and what happens when we have a drought year or an extremely wet year, for example. And then scientists can use this information to make better predictions about the rate at which CO2 will accumulate in the atmosphere, and then in turn make better predictions about how the climate is going to change in the future. Savannas are basically ecosystems that are characterized by uh, a continuous or near continuous understory of grasses within which we have embedded trees. It can range from really open uh, ecosystems such as what we see in the Serengeti all the way to more wooded, uh, wooded ecosystems. Savannas and grasslands are the second most widespread biome type in tropical and subtropical regions. In India, historically, savannas have been misclassified and labeled as unproductive or wastelands by colonial foresters. We know now that savannas are in fact an ancient biome and in India, for example, they host, they're home to very unique and endemic fauna. So things like the black buck, Indian wolf, great Indian bustard, and lesser florican. They also support many endemic plants uh, that are found nowhere else. Well, so soils and uh, climate set the template upon which savannas are structured. So if we look uh, at drier, nutrient-rich areas, so these tend to have very uh, nutrient-rich vegetation that supports high densities of herbivores. So areas like the Serengeti in Africa or the Deccan Plateau in India. And in these, in, in these savannas, uh, the vegetation tends to be very thorny and spiny, so things like acacias, uh, which are well defended against herbivores. On the other hand, uh, in more wetter areas where the soils are not uh, as fertile, the vegetation tends to be nutrient poor, not very good for herbivores, so they don't support large herbivore biomass. But here, fires become an important driver in regulating savanna structure and function. Right? And in these kind of systems, you tend to have trees that tend to be more broad-leaved, not very thorny, but they have a lot of defenses against fires, so adaptations to fires like thick barks and re-sprouting ability and so on. I mean, if you think about grasslands in India, they're actually quite diverse. The Deccan Plateau, uh, which is the nutrient-rich uh, areas, is where you would see a typically high aggregations of ungulates and thorny plants and more open savannas. But whereas if we look at areas like the Western Ghats, which is wetter, or the Gangetic, uh, the Gangetic Plains, here you tend to have taller grass savannas dominated by species that are very nutrient poor, not very palatable for herbivores, and where uh, fires become important. So for example, our work has shown that warming is going likely to lead to greater biomass and greater species richness 
in the wetter alpine grasslands of the eastern Himalaya, whereas, uh, but not so in the drier grasslands of the western Himalaya where rainfall or changes in rainfall is likely to be the more important driver. You know, in the battle to combat climate change, tree planting has emerged as one of the most popular approaches to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and store it in vegetation. And at some level, that's fairly understandable. But when we look at savannas and grasslands, you know, there's not that much vegetation above ground. We don't see that much vegetation. But what people don't realize is that in savannas and grasslands, most of the carbon is actually stored below the ground in soils. And globally, uh, th there's about three times the amount of carbon that's stored in soils compared to what's stored above ground. And <coughs> savannas and grasslands are estimated to account for somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of global terrestrial carbon stocks. Another important thing about them is uh, because most of the carbon is stored below ground, they tend to be more resilient and reliable stores of carbon in the face of future climatic changes such as increases in droughts or increases in fire frequencies. So I was always interested in ecology and wildlife biology, but um, unfortunately there were very few options at that time to pursue a career in that field, at least when I was growing up. And so I ended up doing a degree in computer sciences from Bitspilani, and then I worked in the computer industry for two years. And by that time it was clear to me that this was not something I wanted to you know, do for the rest of my life. And so I ended up going uh, to the US for my master's and for my PhD. And looking back, I think uh, you know, my training in the engineering has really given me a different perspective and has helped me a lot, has helped shape the way I think. So there are definitely more uh, postdocs and early career researchers today than there were a couple of decades ago. There's still too few and particularly people working at the ecosystem level or on issues related to climate change. I mean, there's a clear need for programs in, at the undergraduate level that focus on issues related to ecology, climate, uh, climate science and uh, sustainability. Uh, in terms of the advice that I'd live, like to give to these uh, early career researchers, I'd start off by giving the advice that was given to me when I was a PhD student. The first was read, 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 uh, because nothing expands your horizons more than reading. The second is travel, 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 and spend as much time as you can in the field. I would also add work collaboratively, because many of the issues that we are dealing with are interdisciplinary problems that require interdisciplinary solutions. Uh, think long term. Uh, most of our understanding of ecological processes come from long-term studies, so even if you're starting off, it's good to have a long-term plan. And finally, uh, think big and think outside the box. Well, I was definitely pleasantly surprised to receive the Infosys Prize, and uh, at the same time, it was also a great uh, honor to be recognized alongside an amazing group of scientists, both past and present, who've also received the award. You know, hopefully this award uh, will sort of encourage people who are interested in the field but not aware of the opportunities to pursue a career in ecology and the sustainability sciences. And in terms of my own work, uh, if the award can shine the spotlight on savannas and grassland ecosystems in India, which are still undervalued and underrecognized. If it can make people pause uh, and think about it, then I think that would be extremely gratifying.